I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class, or leg reg, about the case United States v. Bass from 1971. This is a U.S. Supreme Court case that illustrates the classic canon of interpretation called the rule of lenity. Now, for my students, once again, this is in a section of our case book about something we call the canons of construction, which um, depending on who you talk to, are all a hoax or are um, a way of recognizing that statutes are their own sort of genre of literature and have some structural features that are very common and that have to be sort of noted and worked around when you're trying to extract meaning uh, from the statute. And our casebook divides these canons somewhat artificially into what it calls semantic canons and substantive canons. The semantic canons are almost like rules of grammar for how to parse sentences or use consistent meanings of words and so forth. And <clears throat> the substantive canons are really kind of policy rules of thumb or maxims that uh, courts use. So in other words, that they're almost not like canons. They're more like just general jurisprudential rules. And lenity is one of the oldest ones and one of the most famous ones. I'm going to have a companion video for this case that's just about the rule of lenity, sort of uh, in a little more depth than we're going to cover it here. But let's look at what happens in this case. The rule of lenity is always going to come up in criminal cases, by the way, because it only applies to criminal cases. So if you see a case and it's talking about the rule of lenity, someone was being charged with a crime, it's a safe bet, or someone doesn't understand how the rule of lenity works. So in this case, Bass had been convicted of a felony in New York State. As sometime after his release, he was later found in possession of a shotgun and a pistol on separate occasions, which made him a felon in possession. Now, this, um, the statutes in this area have been amended in the years since 1971, but uh, work with me here. It, at the time of this case, it, the relevant statute, 18 U.S.C., um, and then we had an appendix 1202A, provided that any person who's been convicted by a court of the United States or of a state or any political subdivision thereof of a felony and who rece receives, possesses, or transports in commerce or affecting commerce any firearm shall be fined not more than $10,000 or imprisoned um, for not more than two years or both. And of course, <clears throat> this is an older version of the statute. Um, but again, this is sort of our classic felon in possession of a firearm. And we still have thousands and thousands of these types of um, cases every year. A lot of them end up with our federal magistrate judges. If you clerk for a magistrate judge after law school, you're likely to have a lot of social security cases and felon in possession cases uh, as a big part of your workload. So the issue here was that phrase in commerce or affecting commerce and whether it modifies um, the, only the verb right before it transports or also the verbs receives and possesses. And because if it modified all three, then Bass's conviction would need to be vacated because the government at trial had only put on evidence that he possessed the guns, um, and, uh, but not that his possession was in commerce or affecting commerce. In other words, they didn't accuse him of transporting guns across state lines, and that, that wasn't um, the charge in his case. The majority here concludes that the most natural construction of the language would apply the modifier to all three verbs. And it looked at, it has a number of arguments um, that are kind of interesting. This is actually a rich case from a statutory interpretation standpoint, because the majority talks about punctuation, even though we have officially punctuation is not determined, is not dispositive or supposed to control the outcome of the case in a statute, but also the common sense implications of alternate constructions and whether a broader reading of the criminal prohibition would make the statute redundant with other firearm possession statutes. <clears throat> now, from that standpoint, that is a pretty um, 
uh, sophisticated a way of reading statutes is to argue that the opposing side's reading of it would make makes it duplicative basically of another statute and we assume that congress wouldn't pass redundant or uh, just surplusage legislation that if they enacted a separate section that it must have its own standalone meaning the court also made a common sense argument about why it makes little sense to assume that congress wanted to qualify only the verb transports versus all three now, the court acknowledged that the legislative history was really on the uh, prosecutor side here, the government's position, but they said it wasn't that clear. It's not, it's not all that clear, but to what extent there is legislative history, it actually supports the prosecutor or is bad for the defendant. But then the court says, if you weigh it all together, the sum of the various interpretive cues um, uh, left a residuum of ambiguity. In other words, they say, so we've got the legislative history on one side and then um, uh, some arguments that maybe this was supposed to apply, this modifier clause in commerce was supposed to apply to every element of the crime. So in other words, the prosecutor was supposed to prove that e for each element that that element affected commerce. Um, and so because they think that there's some uh, disagree room for disagreement, they say that it should be vacated because of the rule of lenity and a federalism canon, which is a little outside of our scope for purposes of this video. We have other cases that deal with that more directly. So the dissent argued that the structure of the statute and its punctuation and statutory filings, uh, findings and the le legislative history all pointed to the commerce requirements applying only to the verb transports. In other words, they're saying the opposite of what the majority concludes. And they're concluding that the, the verb here, um, uh, the, that last clause really only modifies the word that comes right before it. And I hope you can see that the, this is an, an also a plausible position, right? We don't usually think of possessing things in interstate commerce, but transporting something in interstate commerce, that kind of makes sense why you would say the phrase, like where are you transporting it from and to, and so it makes sense that you're talking about going across state lines. <clears throat> the dissent also compared the sentence with the statute, in the statute with the sentence, I would like to have a cat, a dog, or a cow that jumps over the moon. And the common sense way to read that, they said, is that obviously you're talking about a cow that jumps over the moon. You don't want a cat that jumps over the moon, a dog that jumps over the moon, or a cow that jumps over the moon. By the way, this is a, an interesting form of legal rhetoric to come up with a very almost oversimplified everyday phrase like the cow that jumps over the moon and use it to illustrate a sort of high level sophisticated um, interpretive method like the last antecedent rule, which is what the dissent is really arguing for. And so they're saying the common sense way to read the sentence is the same, um, that basically the last, that last phrase, if you look at that, that jumps over the moon, obviously only modifies cow. It doesn't modify cat and dog. And they're saying the majority would say any phrase that comes at the end of the sentence modifies everything in the sentence before it. So let's talk about this, the rule of the last antecedent. I always call this the last antecedent rule. Um, which holds that referential and qualifying words and phrases where no, no contrary uh, intention appears refer solely to the last antecedent. And I know that's an archaic word. What we mean is the, the last word or phrase that goes immediately before that phrase. And a very common one is in interstate commerce, right? So um, it, when we have federal, especially in the federal system, Congress learned um, in the New Deal era to just tack on in interstate commerce and kind of everything that they enacted so that they could justify it under the Commerce Clause. And that um, made sense. And so, but now the fact that Congress got in the habit of just throwing in the phrase in interstate commerce or affecting commerce creates an interpretive problem for about do we apply it just to the word that comes right before it or to everything in the um, statute or to each element here? 
The majority says that the last antecedent rule isn't a hard and fast rule when its application doesn't make sense or when legislative intent is to the contrary. I hope you can see that, though, we have very smart people on the Supreme Court, so reasonable minds could really reach different conclusions about this because they did. So note that, the, that there's an overlap um, with other statutes here and that that's kind of complicated in this case. And we're gonna come back to that in some other cases. Either interpretation, the broad or narrow reading of the statute produces some overlap with other statutes. And in neither case is the overlap complete. In other words, this is kind of a counter argument to this redundancy uh, argument, like your interpretation makes the statute redundant. Well, there's a lot of statutes that overlap at least a little bit with other provisions and other statutes. And so the question is, how scrupulous are we supposed to be about having um, absolutely no redundancy? Um, the rule of lenity offers a helpful counterpoint, by the way, to other substantive canons. It's among the oldest and most venerable of the substantive canons. And here, um, the majority seems to say that in, uh, this interpretation is lenity is actually required versus inspired by due, the due process clause. And all we're really saying there is that courts over the years, some have um, really grounded the rule of lenity and due process and said due process actually the, requires this or this the rule of lenity is merely an application of due process of law. And others have said that um, due process contains sort of uh, some norms and values that uh, are the same norms and values that we have about fairness that give rise to the rule of lenity. Okay, here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. Um, what is the rule of lenity used by the majority as part of its justification for applying the phrase in commerce to each element that preceded it in the statute? A, courts should construe ambiguous statutes in favor of criminal defendants, or B, courts should apply a final clause only to the phrase immediately preceding it. If you're not sure about this, I'm not sure you were paying attention and you should probably review my video. And that concludes our lecture about United States versus Bass.